Tom, thank you for taking the time to talk to me today. Uh, how are you, firstly? I'm doing great. We're, we're on the heels of Hard to Kill 2023. We're on the way to No Surrender Friday, February 24th in Las Vegas. We'll be live again on Impact Plus, Fight TV, YouTube for our Ultimate Insider. So, I mean, that, I've said it before, Impact Wrestling does not miss when they do a live show. So we're, we're rocking and rolling here to start the year. Mm -hmm. Well, you have, yeah, a lot coming up there and you're just, it's been about a year since you joined Impact. So what has the past year been like for you? Uh, it's been fascinating and fun, just so much fun. Everybody that I'm getting to work with at Impact Wrestling in front of the camera and behind the camera has just been absolutely phenomenal uh personally and professionally i feel so fulfilled uh, i'm loving what i'm doing with impact uh, I'm having the chance to be the lead commentator for impact wrestling it's a position that i'd been striving for for a number of years within wwe obviously that didn't happen but i am ecstatic to have that faith and that trust uh, from impact wrestling so i'm just trying to repay that one week at a time so i'm thrilled for opportunities like this and it's just very special to me to get to represent the company this way. You were absolutely thrown in at the deep end by Impact uh, doing a live pay per view first time out. So, um, like I know what it's like to to prep for things, but for you, like what were the days leading up to that pay per view like coming into a whole new company? Yeah, it was a good couple of weeks of prep, uh, just because I had. You know, I, I knew that I was going to be debuting at Hard to Kill for like a few weeks at that point after we'd gotten things figured out. So I, I part of it was going back and, and just kind of reliving Impact's history in that, granted, I had watched a lot of it as I was a kid and, and growing up. I had paid attention to Impact Wrestling here and there, and then especially when I was in WWE. I always paid attention to what was going on in other promotions, whether it was watching different wrestlers or watching announcers and hearing how they were doing. So I was always aware of what was going on in Impact, but it's a very different thing to be aware of it versus speaking on it authoritatively. So I don't think I've ever taken so many notes in my life as I did for that first Hard to Kill because I just wanted to be prepared and pay tribute to all the things uh, appropriately that were a part of Impact's identity and Impact's history. I wouldn't have gotten through that show without D'Lo Brown. Uh, having D'Lo to call uh, the first dark match that we had just to get like calm and settled, because I hadn't called a wrestling match in about six months. Uh, I hadn't called anything of that ilk really since maybe March of 2021. So, I mean, it, it had been a long time. So mm -hmm. it took a minute for me to settle in, but I, I had a blast that night. Over the past year then, um, what's like the most you've had to unlearn from your time to WWE to um, adapt to Impact? Uh, I've spoken on it before, but uh, WWE obviously has certain things they want their commentators to say and not say, and mm -hmm. that is their prerogative. That is just how they like to position their product on the air. So it's something that you abide by when you're there. Uh, that's just not how Impact Wrestling positions its product. So there's certain uh, words and phrases that I've kind of had to unlearn. And then yeah. other things where it's just opening up my personality and trying different things. And I'm very, very fortunate. I've got Matthew Raywalt, who's a brilliant color commentator to back me up. Josh Matthews, he and I are in lockstep, producer to announcer. And then Scott Demore, who has a lot of commentary experience as well and is my, my boss, is just really good about giving me feedback, positive and negative, just to be like, hey, you know, this works, this doesn't, because I, I'm discovering a lot of new things about myself as a professional. So I'm just fortunate I'm in this environment to try new things. Did you feel that after your first show? Did you feel like the like shackles were off? Um, I don't know if I put it that way. I just know that after the show, I was very emotional. I was in tears. I went back. I hugged Scott and I said thank you because he gave me the opportunity. It, it was very emotional. Uh, you know, there there are a lot of things that happened in my life, personally and professionally, between uh, you know April of 2021 to you know january of 2022 making that debut at hard to kill meant a lot to me and my family and my loved ones and then also my peers uh it was really really special so i felt like i had to i had to nail it i felt like i had to show what i was capable of and uh reinforce the belief in in me that other people had um and i, I do need to publicly thank uh diana perrazzo and steve macklin for opening the doors to me to impact uh, mm -hmm. ultimately helping me get a conversation that that led to a job 
So uh, there's a lot of people that go into any sort of situation, but um, I know I was very, very emotional after that first hard to kill last year. Yeah, you just mentioned Diana there, and like I absolutely love her. She's one of my favorite people to watch. Um, so I take it you've known her a, a while. Like, what do you see the change in her working with her and Impact now? Her her work is spectacular. Um, we got to cross paths. I want to say it was during the May Young Classic. I called a few matches for that um, that were not on the primary show, and I think I got to call a few of her things on NXT. I'm blanking on what they were specifically. So I really didn't know a ton about her initially when she was um, you know in WWE and NXT. Had a couple opportunities, obviously, to call her things, and then it was after the fact. Um, Steve Macklin and I have been friends for over a decade uh, he's a jersey guy i'm a philadelphia guy so we have a lot in common and uh you know when he and i were talking uh before i started with impacts uh, i was not sure if i wanted to still be in wrestling i was not sure if there were any opportunities out there for me so thanks to him and uh diana uh, a door opened a conversation happened and fast forward a year and <laughs> things have been going great so i can't complain for you, um, who are some of the most exciting people to call the matches of and kind of watch as a fan while you're doing your job? Um, I'm loving, uh, obviously, anything with Josh Alexander right now. He's been mm -hmm. outstanding. Uh, to see the evolution and maturation of Jordan Grace has been so much fun. Everything she's done to improve herself as an athlete, as a performer, as a person, uh, I so admire her. Uh, Speedball Mike Bailey, the nickname Speedball is very, very accurate. He is insane. Some of the stuff that he does in the ring is really, really phenomenal. So I'm just lucky that every time we go out there, sometimes there's a new face, sometimes there isn't, but there's always new, fresh matchups that have never happened before. And I get to just be a fan and call. It's a blast. Um, what was it like for you? You mentioned Jordan there. What was it like for you calling the match with Mickey um, the other week? because that was just like, for me, I was like crying before the match even started, so. Well, first of all, the, the tribute that Mickey paid in her entrance to her Native American roots, um, you know, you'd seen a glimpse of that when she was in WWE, I believe she wore some gear for a WrestleMania that was um, Native American inspired, but to see her come out with, you know, her, her, uh, her family around her, her friends, and obviously people from uh, her mother's tribe was supporting her in her entrance. It, it was very, very moving. And the juxtaposition to Jordan Grace, who is every bit of the juggernaut nickname that's been bestowed upon her, it was really emotional. You've got Mickey, who's fighting for her career, and Jordan, who doesn't want to give up her championship. So I, I love the match. Uh, got a little hairy there down the end, obviously thought Mickey might have tapped out, but ultimately she won the championship. And Jordan Grace has been a phenomenal champion for Impact Wrestling. So I, I'm really excited to see what happens for both of them going forward, because Jordan does have a rematch clause. So I'm curious if it's Mickey who has the title when she finally gets to enact that clause. Mm -hmm. Um, also in that show, you did get to sit beside Raven for a bit. What was that like, having him there? So Raven, I don't know if I'd ever met Raven before. He was at Against All Odds in, uh, in, in the summer. And he sat there for you know his match. It was Raven's Clockwork Orange House of Fun match between uh, Sammy Callahan and Moose at the time. So I don't know if I'd ever met him before. Maybe I did in WWE and I'm blanking on it, but you know, obviously I'd watched Raven for years between ECW, WCW, WWE. I mean, uh, even Impact Wrestling, of course. So it was kind of like, I didn't really know what to expect. And there's some things that came out of his mouth at Against All Odds and then also at Hard to Kill that I was like, wow, I wasn't expecting that. So, I mean, the man's a legend. He's an Impact Hall of Famer for crying out loud. So uh, I, I just love it because Impact has such a, deep rich history in regards to wrestlers that have come through and made a stop or had a very long stint and raven's an important part of impact's history so impact you have the deal with the zone now like how exciting is that for you guys and what are you like most looking forward to people seeing from impact with it 
I, I was really excited when the news about the zone broke because I believe Impact Wrestling is available in about 170 countries now internationally. So there's the opportunity to see uh, somewhere down the line to see our live broadcasts uh, when they happen live. I think that's coming soon. Uh, you're getting to see our weekly in-ring product that happens Thursday nights on Access TV here in the United States. And also it's access to our library, which is enormous it's crazy it's now 21 years of history behind impact wrestling so there's all these matches in there that it's like oh i didn't know this person was there or, oh i can't believe this person was at the you know the beginning of their career i'm talking about you know appearances by shinsuke nakamura by the young box um i just looked up some the other day um you know el generico aka Sami Zayn, making a pit stop in impact wrestling all these things can be available on the zone so this is a great opportunity for impact wrestling to just get in front of a global audience not that they weren't before but it just expands things uh so the zone is a perfect home for impact wrestling yeah and, and the uk has always been big impact fans over here so it's, yeah that's great um when you were in wwe like people really you know loved your work but once you came to impact i just hear so much about how great a commentator you are now that you've been given this lead position like people just love it and, and i love it as well and for you what with your experience what makes a good commentator in your opinion well, I appreciate you saying all that. I didn't know if everybody, uh, I didn't know if anybody liked my work in WWE. So I'm very, uh, that, that's very kind of you. No, uh, my experience in Impact, this is all, what I've always wanted. It was what I was always working for in WWE is I wanted to be in that seat as the lead commentator for WWE. That didn't happen. And now I'm in a different place where I've been given that opportunity. That means the world to me that I do not take that lightly. What makes a good pro wrestling commentator is emotion. And that was something that was taught to me at a very young age in WWE. I started in this at 23 years old. And it's just being emotional in the appropriate places. And it's something I, I feel like I feel like I've broken record because I know I've said it to a lot of different outlets and I've said it to other announcers as well. But it's not about what you say. It's how you say it. You don't need to tell me oh, it's the flipping Canadian backbreaker, this, whatever. You can do all that. That's great. And if you can remember all that stuff, it's fantastic. But I would rather you communicate the emotion of a moment mm -hmm. than just say superfluous words. So I think that's a really important thing. There are so many different layers to pro wrestling commentary. Uh, I could go on and on, but I think emotion and passion are the two biggest things. You mentioned getting your start there at, 23 which is amazing i i did want to ask you because i read on your wikipedia and obviously this is probably like 100th of the story but it just says that after a year and a half out of school you were wondering if broadcasting was the right fit when you received a job offer from wwe which like sounds incredible so kind of what what was the process for you receiving that offer yeah, so I, I graduated from Penn State in 2011, and I was working. Uh, I was working in an Olive Garden in the United States uh, as a uh, as basically as like the to-go food counter guy. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how to describe the role. And then I was also calling games on the weekend for a very small college in Central Pennsylvania for like fifty dollars a game. I was doing double headers on Saturdays and Sundays. So I wasn't making a ton and it was getting to a point where I'm applying to different jobs and I'm trying to get more experience, get more tape in sports broadcasting. And I had a conversation that year with my late grandfather and he meant it in the best way possible. And that he said, are you sure this is for you? Have you thought about going back to school? Obviously his concern was for me to be able to make money and support myself. I also took that as, oh no, I'm going to make it. I'm, I'm, I'm going to make it in this industry. So at some point in late 2012, uh, I get a job lead from WWE on a website called statalent.com. And I was kind of like, oh, okay, like I'd been a fan of wrestling as a kid, but I was like, I didn't really think about it. I was kind of very horse blinders towards sports. Mm -hmm. And my roommate at the time was like, do it. You'll mess up. It'll be funny. We'll get a good story out of it. Just like, you know, apply. What, what do you have to lose? And sure enough, I, I actually got invited to do an audition in June of 2012. Ironically, I did that audition with the man who's now my executive producer, Josh Matthews, uh, did the audition up in Connecticut, 
thought it went okay felt better about the play-by-play than like the hosting stuff or you know whatever and uh i was just persistent every you know i think like every two weeks i was emailing the hiring manager of like what's going on what's going on what's going on (laughs) and uh september of 2012 uh i literally just moved into a new apartment in state college pennsylvania for i'd been in for a month and i get this email of you know we'd like you to start as soon as possible and i i just couldn't believe it. So my, I, I was extremely lucky to get that start at 2023, at, at 23 years old, excuse me. And now at 33, having learned everything that I've learned, but also kind of starting all over again in pro wrestling. So it's just trying to learn all these different things, but it's been a fascinating road the last decade. That's great. That's an incredible story. Um, I wanted to ask you about another of your former colleagues that you're working with again. What's it like to be back working with um, Matt, Matt Reynolds and how, like how much has your friendship grown now working together in impact? Yeah, Matthew's fantastic. I don't think he's appreciated enough as a color commentator in professional wrestling. He's very, very good at what he does. Um, I'm not able to do any of the things on the broadcast without him, without my executive producer and I being in lockstep, without our great creative team, without Scott Demore. So, I mean, having Matthew out there after D'Lo Brown shifted into a backstage role, Uh, was spectacular I felt very confident going into that so it's really fun because we just get to open up our personalities we love to needle each other we both have a ton of respect for each other Uh, we both bounce ideas off each other constantly during the day whether it's a live show or a tape show we're in constant communication during those events Um, and and it's funny because I I don't think we communicate a ton in between shows Um, little things here and there but it's amazing to be able to flip a switch when you're at the shows and you just kind of fall into it. So I'm, I'm very, very lucky to be with Matthew. With everyone that you're networking with from your past, what's a, the closest you've ever been to slipping up on a name or a move or anything like that? Oh, I've messed up plenty of moves over the years, but um, I, I have slipped up on a name. Uh, I slipped up on uh, Cesaro once upon a time. I was on the, the WWE app for anybody that remembers that. Uh, and I called him Claudio to his face and he leaned in and he went, Kay Fabe. And I, I, I started just sweating and turning beat red. And the second the camera went off and I'm like, I'm getting fired. I, I know I'm getting fired. So this was before 2015. I didn't even have a beard or hair at that point in time. So I was, uh, pretty sure I was dead in the water. Um, somebody I'm sure can find that clip. But yeah, I called Cesaro Claudio just because I got into a groove with certain people where I would just call them by their real name because they're real people. So it was, uh, yeah, I've definitely made that mistake before. <laughs> At least you'd be correct now, though. So <laughs> Now I would be very correct. Yeah, that would be cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, and finally, like, see, so you've been in Impact a year. So the year ahead, like, what, what are you most excited about for Impact um, and for the fans, whether it be in wing or just with the company? Uh, I'm just excited to take on more responsibilities on air and off air, creating more content, uh, just helping the company take steps forward. Uh, And that's been really, really important to me in this process with them is seeing that this company is making strides. Um, You know, this past Bound for Glory was our most attended event three years. We sold out our first live broadcast, Hard to Kill. Uh, in, in Atlanta. So I hope to see that trend continue for our live broadcasts, especially. Uh, I cannot wait for us to be in Canada because I haven't gotten to perform in Canada in forever, but it's very important that this company with roots uh, in Canada, especially. So um, in March, we'll be in Windsor, Ontario for Sacrifice. In April, uh, we'll be back in Toronto for uh, the Rebellion pay per view. That's really important. We've got some stuff coming up in Chicago this year. So, I mean, it's just bouncing around North America. And hopefully at some point we're able to uh, do things internationally. Now, as you mentioned, they're a great deal with DAZN. Uh, There's just this wonderful international audience for Impact Wrestling. And I hope to just be a part of it.